Praise the Lord, everyone. We are going to get started with Sunday school this morning. Are you excited to be in Sunday school this morning? All right. I, do I have to ask you like I used to have to ask the young people, are you awake this morning? Are you good? Or do, do we need to stand up and shake it out a little bit? You know, what do we need to do to be excited for Sunday school? But no, no, no shaking it out. I got you. All right. No shaking. Hold it in. Hold it in. Just stay excited. All right. So um, this morning we're going to be getting into our Sunday school lesson. And the topic of our lesson this morning is life and hope. Life and hope. And uh, we're going to be reading from Joel chapter 2, uh, verses 23 through 32. It's a little bit lengthy, so just bear with me and we'll get through this. But it says in verse 23, it says, Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately. And he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. And the floor shall be full of wheat, and the fats shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore you to the years that the locust have, hath eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the pe- palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. And ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be ashamed. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and none else, and my people shall never be ashamed. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions." And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days, I will pour out my spirit and I will shew wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and the terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. And I want to focus on verses 28 through 29 where it says, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions, and upon and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days I will pour out my spirit. So he's basically saying that after everything's over, he's going to pour his spirit out on everybody. It wasn't just those that are coming to church. It wasn't just those that are actually sitting on a pew. He said everybody, his his sons, his daughters, the handmaids, the servants, everybody. It didn't matter. So, you know, we see that there that he talks about all this blessing and then he talks about destruction. And so we see that at the end of that, he's still going to do something great. So we're going to go through life and there's going to be ups and there's going to be downs, but there's still hope for us to be delivered from whatever we go through. Whatever God puts into our lives, whatever he allows to come through and we have to walk through, he's still going to deliver us as long as we call on the name of the Lord. So, you know, they, they have this, these things in these, uh, in these lessons called cultural connections. And I was reading it and it kind of made me think because I've lived through the time that they're talking about and now I'm living in this time and I realize that I'm getting older and not younger and it's, it's starting, you know, things in my body are starting to hurt that never hurt before. But, you know, we're going to get through that. But they were talking about before smartphones. And if you talk to a lot of your kids, none of them really understand, you know, before smartphones. Uh, you know, Broden can't fathom the idea that you couldn't play games on your phone. And when you could, it was just one game, and it was in black and white, and if the sun shined just right, you couldn't see it anyway. So, but he, he can't fathom this idea. And, and now I find myself, you know, giving my daughter a phone and, you know, watching her interact with it and going back and trying to, when she goes to my mom's or somewhere, trying to use her house phone. It's the funniest thing to me. And I'm thinking about just going through my house and putting all like the little turned dial phones in there and see, see how that works out. But before smartphones, there was only a handful of people that you would come across that would take their little Kodak camera and load it with film just to take a picture of their food. 
Have you ever seen people? They do it all the time with their smartphones now. I mean, if, if we were to scroll through, uh, I'd, I'd venture to say 100% of the young people's phones. There's some food pictures on those phones. And some of, some of the adults, I'd probably say at least 75% of them, there's going to be some food pictures on those phones. And not the food that you cook that you're proud of. The food that you went out and ordered somewhere, you've taken a picture of that. Or you've taken a selfie with that food. <laughs> Because you're excited about it. But you never found a lot of people that would take their little camera. And you know the camera I'm talking about. You snap the picture and you got to push the little button and hear it wind. And they, they didn't necessarily take pictures of their food. And if they did, everybody thought they were weird. You know, what are you doing? No, don't, don't be a weirdo. Don't do that. But today, photographing food has become a social norm. It, it happens everywhere. You go into a restaurant, somebody takes a picture of their turtle cheesecake and holds it up and you don't think anything about it. You just go on about your day because it's normal. So there's these folks at a place called Feedy. And Feedy has realized something. Feedy has capitalized on this very first world privilege that we have. They have come along and they have noticed that there is a developing hunger in other nations. Uh, you know, there is, there's other nations, and we have, it, we have the issue right here as well, where people are starving. So Feedy has said they're going to capitalize on this. And you can go on your smartphone and you can download the app called the Feedy app. And if you go to a restaurant, a participating restaurant that's signed up with Feedy, and you take a picture of your food and you post it and tag them in it, or you post it through the app, however you want to do it, Feedy donates the cost of your meal to this other organization that provides food for everybody else. So it's a pretty cool thing, but, but you know, they've capitalized on something. They found something that has become, to me, something ridiculous. You know, something that, you know, I, I don't I guess it's because, yes, I'm, I'm old, I guess, I don't know, but it just doesn't, it, I, I don't get it. Even when I was the youth pastor, I didn't get it. You know, put your phone up. We're eating. I don't, you know, but they, they've capitalized on this, and people are doing it like crazy, and they found that in the face of a issue, a problem, they can provide hope for some people, and they've, they've capitalized. So here we see um, that they had the smartphone and the app, and if, if Joel would have had this in his time, maybe it would have been a little better, but I'm willing to bet he, they probably still would have had their issues. You know, Joel might have been just happy with a phone. Then you wouldn't have to run forever just to let somebody know something or, or write a letter, and I don't know how long it took to get there. It probably still got there faster than our mail does right now. But, you know, he, he might have been happy with just a flip phone, you know, just something that he can contact somebody with and let them know. But had they had their smartphones and had they had this app, they still would have been short on food to photograph because God had put them in a famine in this time. So it doesn't matter all the cool things that come up. If God decides to put us in a famine, there's not going to be any food for us to take pictures of. So it doesn't matter what privileges we have right now. So Joel and his beloved Judah were facing severe famine and, and judgment for the sins that they had committed. And God had promised an enemy army would soon storm into Judah and leave famine and death in their wake. I mean, I don't know about you, but I know that living for God, that you're going to have to walk through some things. And I understand that. There's going to be some struggles in your life. But to know God comes down and tells the man of God in your life, I'm about to bring destruction on everybody. And you know it's coming because God's word is yea and amen. I don't know how you live under that type of pressure. You know, at any minute, your whole life is going to change for, for until God decides to let up. So, you know, if it were me, and, you know, I, I'm soft. I, I don't try to be hard or try to be, you know, super manly or anything. God says he's about to bring some destruction and, and no food is coming. I, I'm, I'm hitting my knees right there. Wherever they tell me at, I'm on my knees. Lord, please don't do this to me. But, see, they, they heard that it was coming, and they knew that there's nothing they could do to stop it. But that was not the only promise that Joel received. Once Judah repented of their sins and turned back to the Lord, God promised to restore them. But the thing about it is, you know, I say I would hit my knees and ask God not to do it, but it didn't change the fact that because of what they did, there still had to be famine and destruction coming. Because of what they did, there were still consequences. Just because they, he said, if you turn back to me, you know, I will restore you, but you still got to learn your lesson. 
You still got to go through this so later on you don't do it again. Because you know as well as I do, human nature, if you don't learn your lesson, you're going to do it again. And sometimes if you're hard-headed like me, you're going to learn your lesson and still do it again. You know, it's, it's like that kid that reaches up and touches the stove. When they find out it's hot, they won't necessarily touch the stove again unless you have a hard-headed child like mine, and they are going to touch it again. You know, I, I like to tell my wife all the time, Broden has turned into this daredevil. And he's, I was telling uh, Grandma Batten earlier, I found him outside the other day on his little basketball goal getting ready to dunk, and he had climbed up on top of the retaining wall and was getting ready to jump across the carport and try to dunk on his goal. And so I let him do it. And, you know, my wife's like, you can't let him do this stuff. He's wanting to try backflips off of stuff. And they let him, we let him do gymnastics for a little while, so now he thinks he's an expert flipper. And, you know, he doesn't even cartwheel well, so I'm a little worried about this. But he, he's wanting to do all these things. And my wife's like, we can't let him do that. He's going to break his arm. He's going to do this. And I tell him, just let him go through it. He's only going to do it once. It's going to hurt for a little while, and he's going to be okay. You know, so, and that's what God, his intentions were with them. You know, let them go through this destruction. Let them go through this famine. They're only going to do it once, and they're going to learn their lesson. So, and he promised them, if you turn back to me, I will restore you. And he was not finished. He also promised to pour out his spirit upon all flesh. We still live in the, the glorious overflow of what happened during those times. We are still experiencing him pouring out his spirit and pouring out his, his love and, and, and filling people with the Holy Ghost. We are still experiencing this time after time. And so the trouble, the trouble in this situation was already on the way. The will was already put in motion. So after Joel heard it from the Lord, he went to the old men. He went to the elders and let them know, hey, this is coming. I need your help. I need your help to, to get this out there. You know, I'm going to start telling the younger ones. I'm going to start telling everyone else. And there's going to be a freak out moment. But I need your help, elders. You guys are my rock. You are who I rely on. I need your help to hold everything down and let them know. But God will restore us. So the old men, they would get better news later on after the spirit was poured out on them. And their dreams would be better than the first part of Joel's prophecy. And none of those living in Joel's day, which was probably at, at some point after Israel's captivity in Babylon, had experienced what was coming. Some of them have probably been through bad times, but they haven't experienced what was about to happen to them. Neither had the ancestors that had come before them. This had never happened before. The pending trouble was so disturbing that those whom Joel wrote to would tell their children about it for years to come. It would become a story that they passed down to their great-grandchildren. The news involved insects and drunkards and, and strong innumerable nations with, with lion-like teeth coming upon them. And, you know, this is, this is one of those things that it's, it's a scary time because something's coming and there's nothing you can do about it. You know, if you go through a struggle nowadays, you know, your car breaks down, there's something you can do about that whether it's you're handy enough to work on it yourself or, or you're blessed enough to have somebody else work on it for you, but you can do something about it. You know, you go through a time where you might lose your job, but yet you can do something about it because you can turn to God and you can be proactive and go out there and try to find you a new job. You know, you can cut grass, you can wash some cars, you can do whatever you need to do, but this was an issue and a storm that was coming that they couldn't stop. They couldn't get out in front of it. They, they could try to defend themselves, but it was no use because we all know when the hand of God is in something, you are not going to prosper if you fight against it. So here this pending trouble, so disturbing that, that they tell everyone and they, and they see that clearly this disaster was waiting for them at some point. But why? Why would God do this to his people? His chosen people, the ones that he loves, the ones that he, he reached down and handpicked, these are my people. But yet now I'm about to give them all kinds of trouble. Why would you do that? So nothing in the book of Joel specifies the reason for this coming. You can read the book. There's nothing really in there that tells you why. But at this point, it's important to notice little links throughout the Bible from other books of the Bible. 
You see, among these books, the books of the 12, which are known as the minor prophets, this group of 12 books are bound closely together by a common theme in even in precise languages. Joel has so much in common with the other books that he has been called the anchor of the minor prophets. Joel follows Hosea, and in the book of Hosea, there is no question the reason for the judgment. It's laid out before it even gets to Joel. The people of Judah and Israel had departed from the Lord. They had turned their backs on the Lord. They had decided that they were going to do what they want to do. And a close reading of Hosea and Joel provides a clue about the reason for the judgment pronounced by Joel. Sorry. In Hosea, the rebellious people did not realize it was the Lord who provided their corn and provided their wine and provided their oil as well as multiplying them and multiplying their silver and their gold. They forgot that it was God's blessing upon them. And they thought, you know what? All this stuff's coming in. We're good. We can do what we want with it. We are the masters of our own destiny. You know, we're out here doing the work. It's not God doing the work. We're toiling in the fields. We're doing this. So this is what we are growing. This is ours. So now they, they've turned their back on God. And they, they, realize, they didn't realize that God was blessing them with silver and gold as well. And these, these rebels that were coming in, they, they offered the Lord's gifts, the Lord's stuff to Baal. And, you know, we know that God is a jealous God. And you start offering up what was meant for him to other things that aren't for him. And you're going to find yourself in a word of, world of trouble. But, but they start offering it to Baal. And, and as consequences of God's mercy on Hosea, the corn and the wine and the oil would have to be restored in Joel. It would have to be restored after everything. So early in Joel, we discover the judgment of the Lord involves this same issue with everything. When Joel said in chapter 1, verse 10, the field is wasted and the land mourneth and the corn is wasted and the new wine is dried up and the oil languisheth. And after the people have repented, the Lord responds in chapter 2, verse 19, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil and ye shall be satisfied therewith. So at first glance, this connection may seem more of just a coincidence that this happened here and then God gave somebody else a, a word and he speaks it out. But Joel and uh, Hosea and Joel are not the only two books of the minor prophets that refer to corn and wine and oil together. And it is apparent that there is a purposeful connection between these two, Hosea and Joel. They are linked together linguistically. I like that. That is an SAT word, and I have worked on that one. So linguistically. So it is no surprise that they are positioned next to each other. There's no surprise that they come right after each other. So Joel does not need to provide detail for the reason of the judgment because it was already laid out. So that's, that's another reason you need to read your Bible. You start reading something and doesn't understand why something is happening, you may need to go back a little bit, read a little bit more so you can get some context. You know, I, in school I used to, you know, you have to do your homework. I would just read the section that, you know, I, the answer is supposed to be in only to find out there was no answer. And then you have to go back like three chapters later to find it. So, you know, sometimes you have to go back and look or sometimes just go back and reread something because every time you reread the Bible, you were going to find something different. You were going to find something else that, that kind of jumps out at you. So Joel doesn't need to provide a reason because it's already there. It's the same reason in Hosea. The people were rebelling against the Lord. It's simple. You're going to go through something with God? It's probably because you were rebelling. You were doing something that God required or that God did not require of you and has told you not to do it. So the link between these is pretty clear. And we can see even in the Bible, the, the link from the book of Deuteronomy and the prophets is also clear. Again and again in Deuteronomy, the Hebrew prophets reminded the people of Israel of the judgments of the book of Deuteronomy, that of what they warned upon those who rebelled against the Lord. They also reminded Israel of the promised restoration for those who repent and stay under God. Joel is no exception. So after Moses, you know, he chiseled these two new stones, uh, two new tablets to replace those that he brought down from Sinai and, and got upset and broke. He, he had to do them again. He ascended to the mount, mountain again, and the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, 
the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. See, given the heinous nature of Israel's rebellion at the foot of Sinai, the promise of restoration is still remarkable. You know, while, while Moses is up there and he's receiving that word from God, these, these children of Israel who were waiting knew they were waiting on a word from God, were down there making their own God, doing what they wanted to do. And I, and I know it angered God, but yet he goes back up to, to God and God says, you know what, these are my people and I'm going to restore them. You know, how many times have you found yourself knowing that God had a promise for you, knowing that God was going to do something great in your life, and even the man of God has spoke over you and told you this was going to happen, but yet you walk out of the doors and still try to either do your own thing or try to make whatever was spoken over you happen by yourself. And, you know, I've told you from the beginning, I'm hard-headed. I had to learn things the hard way, and every time something was spoken in my life, you know, I wanted it right then. So I would go out and try to make it happen and do things that God didn't want me to do just to make these things happen, only to find myself in a bigger hole than I was before. And then I have to wait for God to restore me before I can even receive the promise or whatever he's spoken in my life. So here we see this throughout the the children of Israel turning their back on God and God restoring them and showing his love to them. And Joel knew that, that his text, what he was writing, what he was, what he was speaking was appropriated in his call for fasting and repentance. See, the only way to really get in tune and hear the word of God is one, we must first repent and make sure everything is out of our lives that is not of God, but then we must begin to fast so we can get our, our flesh in subjection and get ourselves lined up to God. So he can begin to speak and pour things into our life. He said in Joel chapter 2 verse 13, For he is gracious and merciful and slow to anger and of great kindness and repenteth him of the evil. So Joel was a prophet who was inspired by the Spirit and whose consciousness was informed by the most ancient of scriptures and by the, by the writings of those who may have been his peers or those that were wiser than him or those that have come before him. See, Joel was smart enough to know we have to learn from the mistakes of those that have come before us. You know, so many times we think that we can do whatever and what happened back there is not going to happen here. But if we remember history repeats itself, then we know that what the people that have come before us, what our elders have went through. You know, we need to heed their call and heed their warnings. Because if we're listening to what they're, what they're saying, they've been down the same paths that we're heading down. It's not like, you know, oh, well, they're just talking because because they, they want to hear themselves talk. But no, they've been down the same street. They're standing there watching us and say, I've passed that before. And I've, I've seen that before. And I've tripped on that before. And they're trying to warn us. But yet we don't want to learn from anybody else because we know better. You know, we know what we need to do. You know, we're adults and we're children of God and we're super holy. And God speaks to us directly. So we know exactly what we need to do. But sometimes God's looking down like, I would speak to you if you would be smart enough to hear the word that I'm giving to you from your right. You know, so, you know, growing up, I would, I would, you know, growing up in church, I, I would get called to the pastor's office a lot, a lot. And when I was going to the school that the church provided, I, I got called in even more. And it was always, he would, he would tell me things. And Michael, you have, to, you have to quit doing this. And if you would just straighten up, God wants to do this in your life. Like, ah, it's okay, I'm good. I know what I'm doing and I'm going to be okay. And of course, I found myself receiving a call from God and having no idea what to do with it. You know, and, and being lost for a while trying to figure it out and having to wait for God to restore me because I, I knew better. I didn't listen to the ones that tried to warn me, and I had to find myself in places of repentance and places of fasting so I could be back in tune with what God was wanting to do. So we need to understand today that God is our only hope when we go through dif difficult times. When we know that it's coming, God is the only thing that we can rely on. There are a lot of other things in the world that we can turn to. However, there's nothing that's going to be tangible enough for us to hold on to when that wind really starts to blow. Everything that we think is important to us, when God's wind starts to blow, it's like, a, it's like a hurricane coming through. It's all gone at the end, and here we are trying to find where we landed. 
But yet if we can, we can learn that God is our hope in this difficult time when those winds starts to blow and we hold on to him, when it's all said and done, we're still in the same spot. We haven't lost anything. We haven't, we haven't had anything leave us. We can still continue on, and we're still just as close to the promise as we were when we started going through it. So these links between Joel and Hosea and Deuteronomy raise the question whether we should expect such links, and this is another SAT word that I worked on, often referred to as intertextuality. And I was, I was so afraid I was going to mess that one up. Intertextuality. And between Joel and other books. So it's basically it's just a fancy word saying Joel's words line up to the other words. <laughs> So, and I did, yes, look it up. So, there are indeed other links such as between Joel 3.16 and Amos 1 and 2, where Joel said, the Lord shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. And then Amos wrote, the Lord will roar from Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. See, they're both saying the same thing. So, when we speak... When we see precise quotations or paraphrases throughout the scripture, we must pay attention. And we have to pay attention to those specifically because scripture interprets and applies itself. In the case of Joel and Amos, Joel's statement continues, And the heaven and the earth shall shake, but the Lord shall be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. And then Amos continues, and the inhabitations of the shepherds shall mourn, and the top of Carmel shall wither. So here we see the first part of it, they're saying the same thing. The second part of it is different. So although the last half of these two verses differ, a conceptual similarity is evident. They, they still kind of go along because both present a disturbance in the natural realm. Both present saying, hey, you're going, you're about to go through something. But Joel alone offered hope. And because Hosea hadn't had, he didn't receive that, that promise of the hope. All he received was there was something coming. And here Joel says it's coming and there's hope behind it. So although they, they, they differ, they're still the same, just a little bit more. And that's how God is. Once we, once we hear something from God or, we, or God speaks something or has somebody speak into our lives and only gives us a little bit of it. If we continue to move forward and say, okay, I don't understand what this means right here, but I'm going to put this in my pocket, and we're going to keep moving forward, and sooner or later, it's going to make sense to me. And as we get to another point, then God gives you something else, and you can kind of put it together and be like, that's what that is. Let's use that now. So these people, the children of Israel are so afraid about what's coming and knowing that Hosea said destruction's coming, and then Joel says destruction's coming, and it's got to be bad if two people are saying it. But then all of a sudden, Joel says, but I will restore you. So don't worry about what you're going to go through. It's going to be hard. It's going to be rough. It's going to be, it's going to be awful, but I've got you, and I'm going to take care of you. So Joel and Amos appear next to each other in the scriptures, and on Pentecost, Paul quoted from Joel to explain the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So in the Old Testament we see it and then and then Paul turn or Peter turns around and quotes it again in the New Testament. Right before the Spirit of God is getting ready to be poured out, he quotes Joel when he says, "I'm going to restore you." He he quotes him when he says in in uh in response to the teaching that it was necessary to be circumcised and to keep the law of Moses to be saved. And then James quoted Amos uh, to explain the decision made by the gathered apostles and elders. And you can see that in Acts chapter 15, and it corresponds to Amos chapter 9. And after quoting from Amos, James says, Known set unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. And then this statement means that we can expect to discover the anticipation of the New Testament realities in the Old Testament because it's prophesied that things are going to happen, that his spirit is going to be poured out. And he said his spirit's going to be poured out in the last days. And, and then we see in the book of Acts where his spirit is poured out. His, and even today, we watch his spirit being poured out. Over the last few weeks, we've watched kids be baptized because God poured his spirit out upon them. 
God filled them with his, with his Holy Spirit and let them experience the love and the joy and the peace that he has. And we see that cycle happen over and over again when people will get outside of their selves and get outside of their struggle and find themselves a place where, where God can begin to work on them. You know, it's always amazing to me when I can get back, get, be able to watch somebody filled with the Holy Ghost. I mean, it's, it's an amazing thing to be able to pray for somebody when they receive the Holy Ghost. And you have to be careful because it's been said so many times, you think you have superpowers at that point. You know, uh, I, you know, that first person that you pray through to the Holy Ghost and they start speaking in tongues while your hands on them and you walk away like, yeah, <laughs> who's getting it next? <laughs> and if you're not careful, you can get addicted to that and, and, and want that. But see, we get to see, you know, people's lives changed right here every day. We get to experience that prophecy that was put out, that promise that in the last days I'm going to pour my spirit out upon all flesh. And if you've ever had the privilege to watch somebody get the Holy Ghost, watch their, their sins begin to, to just go away from them and, and watch God fill them with something they've never had before and to stand back and watch the countenance on their face change. You know, I've seen some of the people with the, the grumpiest faces I've ever seen begin to change into a smile in a moment. You know, the, you, these hard guys that, that won't let up and they, they come to the altar just because somebody asked them to and they stand there tight and tense and then all of a sudden just begin to let go. You know, watch, watch children who have gone through things that no child should go through begin to feel love that they've never felt before. And begin to just bask in the presence of God. And that's what we get to experience. You know, that's what, that's what also tells us we need to be careful. Because obviously we're in the last days. Because we're seeing his spirit poured out time and time again. And we need to make sure that we are not making the mistake that the children of Israel did. We're, that we're not turning our backs on God. Or, or becoming complacent and, be, and becoming comfortable with what's going on in here. You know, it should bother us in every service that, that we go through. This the Sunday service happened and the presence of God sweep through here, but the waters are not troubled. That should bother us. Because God's wanting to pour his spirit out, and he showed us that. And he's, he's even shown up in a place where, you know, right now everybody is filled with his spirit, but yet he still shows up. One, to give you whatever you need to go through what you're going through. But two, he's showing up in anticipation because we've showed up with anticipation and expectation. God's shown up with anticipation that he has told us to be witnesses unto all the earth and to draw people unto him. So he shows up with the anticipation that he's ready to fill somebody. It's just our responsibility responsibility to get them here so we have to quit being shy about things and realize that if we are going to accomplish and receive all the promises that God has given us then we have to do what is required of us we have to daily find ourselves in a place of repentance and make sure there is nothing in our lives that is not of God and ask God to walk the halls of our hearts and remove those things that are not of him those things that we may not even realize we've allowed in there but remove those things so we can have that pure heart and we can walk before him blamelessly and, and we can begin to speak to people and him work through us with no hindrances. Because if we don't allow him to do those things daily and those things that we don't even know about begin to grow in us, then they become roadblocks for us that hold us up from receiving what God has for us. So we see where, where they, are, they are saying that the anticipation of the New Testament realities come in the Old Testament. We learn about these. And one of those expectations is that there is hope for believers in the most difficult of times. When you walk through something that, that you couldn't possibly imagine, like your whole world is coming down. But yet there is hope for you on the other side. There is hope for you when... when uh, you don't know where to turn. If our difficulties are due to our sins, repentance is available to us. And just as it was in Joel's day, if they are due to the actions of others, hope is still promised unto us. The Lord himself said in, in Joel chapter 3 verse 16, will the, will, he will be the hope of his people. You know, and when you go through things, God is just standing there making sure that you're going to lean on him and you're going to trust in him so he can bring you through it. Because if you try to do it on your own and you try to, you know, just push through it, he's going to let you do it. 
ah, go ahead, dummy. I'll be here when you get done. You know, we'll see what happens. You know, uh, when when all of this corona stuff first started, you know, many of you know, I, I went into work one day only to find out I didn't have a job anymore. And it was it was one of those things, no, you know, no uh, warning, no nothing. I mean, the, the people that, the guy that I worked directly for knew what was happening and did not warn me. All he said was, hey, they need you in Opelika. They need to talk to you up there. And I thought it was about an issue we had the previous day where we had, we had an employee test positive uh, for uh, corona, and it was I had never dealt with it before, and I was kind of unsure of the process. And so I thought that's what I was going up there for so we could learn the process because I heard other people were going too. And when I walked in, I was standing in the lobby of the office, and as I was standing there, I saw the HR lady from Birmingham park her car and come in too. And at that point, I knew, ah, my time here is done. You know? So when I walked in there, they told me, you know, hey, we're, we're having to do a layoff. You know, we're not making as much money right now. And, I, and at that point, you know, I really didn't know what to do. The first thought that crossed my mind is the thought of, you know, probably any husband or father. I've got two kids at home. I've got a wife. You know, yes, my wife works, but it's a part-time job. How are we going to do this? But then all of a sudden, there was a peace that came over me, just sitting in the chair. Don't worry about it. I got you. And I said, okay, all right, I, I'll, I'll trust you. I've been through the no job thing before. I will trust you. You've provided for me. I'm going to learn from my mistakes, and we're just going to roll with it. And I will tell you this, as long as you can trust God through your storm. Now, it was uncertainty left and right, and I wasn't sure. I had to go home and look my wife in the face, and if you've never done that, there is no greater fear, no, nothing that makes you feel less of a man than come in and tell your wife you can't provide for her right now. But yet, with that peace that I had, God stepped in. And during that time, I went from, from June or July of 2020 to January of 2021. But God provided for me at every turn. What, what happened was pastor was having to deal with a pandemic. Pastor was having to deal with what was going on, and pastor owned a business. And so he came to me and said, hey, I need help. Can you help me? And I was like, well, you know, it works out pretty good. He knew I lost my job. He needed help. So I stepped in. And when I tell you from the time of July to January, I made more money in that time than I did at the job that I was at. You know, and then turn around and just at the right moment, pastor comes to me and says, hey, I'm getting ready to sell my business. Uh, you know, it's becoming that time that we're going full time. I said, all right, you know, I understand. Pastor told me that. And two weeks later, I had a job. And I had the job that I had wanted before that pastor told me one day you're going to have your boss's job at a previous job. And they hired me back in my boss's job. You know, so God showed me at that moment, as long as you stay faithful, you know, don't don't break away. Don't worry. You're going through financial struggles. Still pay your tithes. Still give your offering. Still stay faithful to him and trust him. Because when you do, he's going to take care of you. And when the time is right, when you come through that storm, as long as you've been holding on to him, you're still in the same place you were when it came. And then he's able to say, all right, now let's step into your blessings. Let's step into what I have for you. Let's step into your promise. And here we see it. As long as they, when they decided, the children of Israel decided to repent and decided to turn away from what God, from, from what they were doing against God. God began to open up the windows of heaven and begin to bless them. And, and he, he did supply all of their needs and he kept them in their struggle and kept them in their storm. And then at it all, he did restore them. He did create a great nation out of them and it didn't knock them out and it will not knock you out. Whatever you go through, understand today that there is life in your situation and there is hope in your situation as long as you cling to the hope of eternal glory that God gives us. There is hope for everything that we go through as long as we stay strong, stand fast. Don't, don't let all these distractions turn your head. Know that God's got me. God will supply for me. God will do what he said he's going to do because God said he is not a man that he cannot lie. And what he says is yea and amen. And it doesn't, when, when I say that your God is a God of, of just utter promises and things coming to pass, when God spoke the universe into creation, still to this day, because he spoke a word, 
they're still finding new stars and still finding new areas of space because things are still being created off of the word that he spoke way back then at the beginning of the world. So just because your, your promise and your restoration doesn't come when you think it's going to be there or when you think it should be there, life and hope is still there in your situation. Life and hope is still there even if it's not when you want it. Just because your hand's out doesn't mean you're going to get it. Just because Broden asks for a snack before bed doesn't mean he's getting a snack before bed. Unless he's with his grandma, that might be a different story. But he's not going to get it you know, out of me now. Maybe if, he's, if other circumstances are going on, he might get that from us. And that's just icing on the cake. So just because you're telling God that I need this and I want this and I have to have this, God knows what you need. And as long as you take the provision that God has given you through your storm and you hold on to the life and hope, the extra things he gives you is just icing on the cake. All right, let's, let's pray. And then we've got a few minutes and then we'll be getting into our afternoon service. Let's pray right now. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to come together into your house, Lord, and lift you up, God. Lord, we thank you for the chance to worship you, God, and I thank you for the opportunity to speak this morning, Lord, and I pray that, that this lesson grab hold of somebody and give them something to hold on to as they go through whatever it is that they're going through or they're about to go through, Lord. God, I pray when they find themselves in situations that, that they remember that there is life and hope in everything as long as it comes through you, Lord. God, I pray over this service coming up today that you would do your will throughout this house. Have your way, Lord. Whatever you want done, Lord, let it be. Let your will be done, God. Lord, I pray over every musician, over pastor, over, over every saint, God. Focus our hearts and minds, Lord, and let lives be changed through you today, Lord. God, we praise you and we worship your name, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.